Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session of Thai Talkies. Uh, my name is Dishan bin Shahid. Uh, I am executive director of Thai Islamabad. Uh, before we start, let me just give you a brief intro of what Thai is and what we do. So Thai is a non-profit organization that's headquartered in Silicon Valley. It was founded in 1990s during a dot-com era by a few Pakistanis and Indians in order to help out the aspiring entrepreneurs uh, from from india and pakistan to establish their business in in the valley uh since then it 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 uh, started reaching out to di uh, different chapters different cities across the globe today we have 61 chapters uh worldwide uh, islamabad chapter was founded in 2008 uh so that is where we started our activities in pakistan uh our basic mission or the objective is to help entrepreneurs or uh, and foster innovation uh we provide entrepreneurs with mentoring incubation funding uh and training and networking uh, so this is this is this is how we build our programs around in pakistan our footprint is uh, all over the pakistan we've been working from uh, gilgit baltistan to uh, koita karachi and place like lahia jamshoro uh we've uh, we working with startups we work with smes we working with micro entrepreneurs to help them launch their businesses or accelerate their business growth uh so that's a bit that's a bit about time and like every uh a responsible organization uh during these tough times uh we think it's also a responsibility to contribute towards uh helping people in this covid-19 i think best way we can help the society or best way we can help uh pakistan is by helping out entrepreneurs uh and by sharing knowledge and sharing our resources with them right so this tie talk is part of uh that series and uh i'm i'm thank a very uh, thankful to morin zaidi who took time out uh, uh to uh be be with us today and share her knowledge uh, about the topic so a topic for uh so before before i before i go to the topic let me just introduce uh morin to you as well so she's currently the head of governance and contracts at uh jazz Uh, she holds a level 1 degree in international business law from university of manchester she has worked in telecommunication sector for more than a decade and she specializes in telecommunication law her areas of expertise include contracts mergers acquisitions and company secretarial work and regulatory laws she is currently serving as head of governance and contracts at jazz as i mentioned earlier she is also serving as the company secretary of the jazz board uh, morin is Uh, passionate about advocacy for change literacy vocational training to drive the underprivileged towards better employment and promotion of local industry uh, moin is also a very good friend uh, we in fact went to the school together so we go long time back yeah so uh, so let's just uh, i mean so the, so the topic for today is covid 19 uh, uh, and force majeure because we feel there's a lot of uncertainty around force majeure and uh, and its application in covid-19 so uh, i believe it will be it will be uh, great to have moin's opinion on that and probably it will help us by the end of the session we'll have some clarity about the uh, force majeure during the time of uh, covid-19 so we let's just you know first start with uh, you know very basic very basic question you know what's what is force majeure uh assalamualaikum everyone and thank you for having me and for the kind introduction zishan um yes these are indeed testing times and business uh, it, it is it is what you would call a novel situation it's nothing like the world has ever seen before um force majeure is uh, a clause that we we lawyers are very very much aware of a standard your yeah, boilerplate uh, what what you call clause it's always there in the contracts but essentially force majeure is a concept that does not have a statutory definition it is something that we pakistan because our grun norm our basic legal system um, 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 you know it comes from the british legal system so in english uh, common law this concept uh, started and uh, since then on uh, that concept has also gone on to become part of the law uh, in pakistan and many other countries so force majeure is essentially the occurrence of a set of circumstances which 
parties could not have reasonably foreseen um, or you know they could not have reasonably predicted that those those circumstances will occur so these would in, uh, you know um, include a uh, situation where there's a lockdown you know where there is an act of god there is terrorism you know or god forbid you know there is a famine or na a natural disaster that's come and um, this current corona virus situation is again um, you can consider it to be an act of god or you know it can it can fall in various areas it can also be looked at as as a lockdown or you know restricted movement or you know um, sort of uh, arbitrary uh, rest, uh, movement uh, uh, restrictions that are placed on uh, by the government so um, keeping that in view uh, force majeure is something that has now suddenly come into play with this corona um, situation, considering that all your shipments coming from um, foreign countries, you know, whether those were goods being transported by sea, they're all halted. Your routes um, from one place to another are all halted. You know, you can't travel freely. Um, there is Section 144 implemented throughout. Um, so more than four people cannot, uh, you know, uh, gather at one place. So your workplaces are essentially not functioning the way they used to. Yes, you know, there's internet, we're working from home. Um, you know, a lot of your facilities, your vendors, your services are not uh, performing um, because, you know, they're unable to, you know, uh, the entire, you can say, supply chain um, um, is disrupted because things are not moving from the from the starting point. So in a nutshell, that's uh, the, the way force majeure has applied. It applies to the COVID-19 situation is essentially, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a classic uh, application you would say of of the concept All right thank you Maureen. so so we'll i'll be focusing uh, you know more towards uh, the application uh, for businesses for smes for small businesses right for mm -hmm. startups for smes so let's just say uh, uh, for force majeure to be applicable be it in pandemic or be it any other situation is it necessary to have this clause already built in your contract? Because many of the people, many people, you know, many of our contracts, especially the rental contracts, general rental contracts, no personal mm -hmm. rental contracts, right? They they don't include this clause already, right? Many so so if in this situation, in this current emergency pandemic situation where countries are declaring emergencies, where WHO has declared emergency, global emergency, right? So does it have to be already present in the uh, in your contract? Um, Acha, what how we basically take it is that um, usually um, in in the corporate sector, corporate um, rental contracts and whatnot, what what we have, we have force majeure as a standard practice um, included in contracts, and the including force majeure um, clause essentially means that you know the remit and the applicability of the force majeure clause is going to be as per the contract. So, for example, I have it uh, stated in the contract that. In case of a force majeure situation, which keeps uh, in continuity start for a period of 30 days, then after 30 days, either parties will have the right to terminate the contract or, uh, you know, um, the payment wise, we say that, okay, you know, we are going to pay you. Um, one party is going to pay the other for services that have actually been rendered rather than the entire contract period, which is obviously not going to happen. In an event where there is no force majeure clause, um, there is a concept in the um, Contract Act and the Law of Pakistan called uh, the concept of frustration of contract so where there is no force majeure clause but a frustration event has occurred which essentially means that something has happened to the effect that the whole point of the contract has become frustrated so even then um, you can say that parties do have recourse to this entire frustration um, uh, doctrine that's there in the law so um, in case there's a rental contract now, um, rent contracts, again, um, are, are very peculiar because, you know, this, the, the lessor may be a private party who has rented you a certain space to, say, for example, place your equipment or a storage area or something like that. Now, if I have a storage area where I am storing, uh, you know, my work-related like spare parts and stuff like that, I cannot necessarily use the force majeure clause over there because you know it that 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 uh, that that uh, the purpose of that contract is not really impacted because i'm using that space to to store extra uh, you know spare parts that i have right so corona or not i'm still you know utilizing that space so i cannot stop paying the lessee uh, uh, you know the lessor just because you know i uh, a pandemic has occurred that's the situation Oh, now, if I have a contract with somebody uh, where I am renting um, a space for, uh, for example, a telecommunication tower or something like that, that is a situation where this may kick in. 
you know, three months, I pay the rent in a certain way. For example, I'm paying it quarterly or I'm paying it half yearly or yearly rent in advance. After that, if I decide not to continue, then I can citing force majeure and the 30 day notice period if it's present there. So it really depends on, uh, you know, you, it's not a, you know, uh, uh, sort of a getaway clause as it is that you can actually discharge all your legal obligations because the force majeure event is happening all across uh, the, the country. Right. Here's the thing, right? This, this question was going to come a little later, but since you've already mentioned it, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask it now. This, this 30 day uh, notice clause, right? How is, how does that actually work? Uh, in, in, in this situation and especially in, in terms of rentals, right? Because most of the contracts uh, are based on 30, 30 days notice. And in this situation, how, what, what, would be, what would be the application of force mayor here on this 30 day notice? Um, so, okay, the notice that you're talking about, 30 days, so one, one we have, which is called a termination notice, which if I want to terminate a contract, I will give my landlord a 30 day notice or my, uh, you know, let's see a 30 day notice and say, okay, from here to 30 days, you know, you're supposed to vacate this premises. Um, now, when we're talking about uh, rent agreements, which, and especially, again, it, it depends on whether you're talking about rental agreements, the context of the corporate sector, because the corporate sector, we don't have monthly rental agreements, right? We have quarterly or half yearly or uh, yearly advance um, agreements where you pay a lump sum to a certain party and you know you utilize that space. Now, for example, I have uh, we're sitting in the month of April and for example, I've paid um, a le certain amount of lessors uh, advance rent for three months for the year 2020. Now, uh, March, that rent has finished and my new uh, you know rental uh, uh, payment again number one depends on um, the kind of uh, service for for which i'm utilizing that space so if it's just a storage area um, you know i cannot reasonably cite force majeure because really it doesn't affect my contract with the landlord right I'm still using the space. Now, if it's a if it's a tower site, or you know, if it's if it's a site that I have rented for you know some office space, or you know, which I no longer need, that is where I can, um, as a, a party that raises the force majeure notice, um, has the onus of proving that they have done everything that is in their um, you know reasonable um, control to mitigate the circumstance. So if I have to now uh, cite this notice, again, when I'm citing a force majeure condition does not mean uh, that this is, I have an intention to terminate. It means that, all right, this event has happened. So I will not be performing my obligations as per the contract because I cannot, I'm unable to, I'm in a position where I can't. So in that situation, um, I will write to the other party, um, you know, give them a notice that a force majeure event has, has occurred. Now from that day, Till the next 30 days, again, if, if this is specifically mentioned in the contract itself, in the clause itself, if the post majeure event continues to happen and a month passes, 30 days pass, then on the 30th day itself, either of us will have the option to terminate. Does not mean we can we have to necessarily terminate. We can continue. You know, we can we can continue uh, this this uh, sort of a you know limbo situation where you know we can continue with this kind of a contract where nothing is really happening and you know both parties get nothing, um, or you know perhaps we work out an arrangement that in between we can perhaps you know maybe uh, pay part of the rent and you know not pay most of it. But again, force majeure or occurrence of force majeure does not mean that termination is definite. Then a proper process has to be followed going forward. Right. Thank you. So, so uh, let's just let's just talk about mitigating the risk. How can a startup or a small business, let's say, if, if he or she uh, fails to deliver on his contract due to this due to this pandemic, due to due to this COVID nineteen situation, what are the steps that those businesses they need to take to ensure that they can prove right? I mean, some examples that you know they've 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 done enough to try to mitigate the risk. How how does that work? Um, that's that's a very uh, tough question, um, particularly because it really um, the two ways that you can look at it. One is from the from the aspect of a developed country, where you know you have um, good insurance, uh, you know uh, mechanisms. You've got uh, you know good fallback options. You know your banks, your your you know if you've taken loans, uh, you know you get tax leverages. Um, th there's 
again, the way a first world or a developed country um, and the small businesses or entrepreneurs in, in those areas take these things are different. But in a developing country or a developing economy like Pakistan, where there's a lot of dependency, for example, um, you know, a, a big business will have a lot of vendors, you know, who will be, you know, performing functions such as security or, you know, refueling or, you know, cleaning and all that. So, you know, while the bigger company may find it easier to survive in terms of, you know, they've got some fallback options, they've got some plans, they've got insurance, they've got, they have the ability to, for example, have people work from home, you know, they can cut down on uh, some expenses. But then again, those expenses will be these small time businesses like, you know, uh, companies that provide drivers, you know, companies that provide vehicles, um, uh, companies that provide security guards. And then, you know, they have all these workforces that go, uh, that, that, that depend on, on, on these day-to-day, -day, um, you know, business functions. So for that, um, to be honest, in the first hit that comes in small businesses is to the, the, the employees, right? So then, you know, this laying off of staff comes on and all. Yes, but what we can do now, um, the government has taken certain steps. For example, um, government has announced uh, that, you know, you cannot uh, let go of your workforce uh, and, you know, not pay them any severance pay. So yes, the government is taking, um, you know, steps towards this. But to be honest, risk mitigation for an unseen event like this is perhaps in all reality only restricted towards oh, you know, I cannot give my deliverables because the force majeure circumstance occurred. But as long as, you know, the money that I have to give to the people that are on the field or if I bought something and it's, you know, it's a consumable, which is now, you know, um, getting wasted. Whether I have that insured and all, yes, in theory, that should be there. But in practice, in a developing country, that's barely ever the case. So, you know, I would have a vendor who provides batteries um, to, uh, you know, um, certain aspects of my business nationwide, but that vendor would not have had those batteries in short. Maximum he would rely on is the guarantee that comes with that battery, you know. So maybe he can in cash on that guarantee, but then insurance in our country, for example, is a bit expensive. So yes, when starting a business, perhaps um, these things should be kept in mind in the, in the normal course of business as well, that um, maybe investing a certain amount in insuring for such circumstances is important and i think um this the, uh, uh, you know hopefully we will get out of this situation soon but this corona pandemic um would have taught that lesson to to the way business works to you know how how normal see should when whenever we go back to normal you know people will have to keep these things in mind right okay so so for the audience i've i've uh if you have any questions, you can drop your questions uh, over here on the chat or on the uh, on the uh, on the Facebook Live. Uh, and I've, I've tried to base my questions uh, on the feedback that I've recently received from from various people from various various startups or businesses. Uh, but if if there's anything missing, please feel free to ask. Uh, we'll 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 take question. We'll uh, we'll be uh, we'll take question at the end. Right. So, okay. So when moving on. Uh, companies globally, you know, are being impacted by COVID-19 outbreak through both the labor market and the, and the supply chain. And these are the, these are the areas that, that are being affected most. So, and, you know, so, so for that very same reason, you know, scheduled orders are either being not delivered or there are some delivery delays or they're being rejected under the claim of force majeure. You know, so let's 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 talk about the rejected part first. Uh, for example, a business, uh, a small time vendor, or any 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 business, um, you know, has uh, ordered something before this COVID nineteen, and now, you know, he or she is having to reject the business is having to reject the order due to uh, this this pandemic because probably, you know, the business cannot pay for the order anymore. Right, because they're trying to cut the cost, or they're trying to uh, they're trying to reduce the labor cost or any cost, right? For for any for any uh, of the cost reasons, they're not they're not being able to pay for that. So the, does 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 the, the uh, so the force mayor does it apply over here as well? 
um again depends on whether they have a contract or not because a lot of uh, small time vendors or small time uh, businesses um generally um are uh, in the habit of either signing out whatever the big company gives to them without reading it or they work on a po basis you know that a po is issued which with like four or five lines on po po purchase order and you know they'll they'll provide the service so depending on number one if there's a contract that they've uh, kept because usually um the problem is that um smaller entities don't read contracts and especially when they get it from a bigger business they will sign off whatever because the big business always ends up saying you know this and you know either sign this and uh, or you know uh, this is non negotiable so it's always very very important to read something and understand it so for example um if i um am a uh, if i run a small uh, business and uh, right now i can't just say oh force major sorry i can't pay you know that 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 that's uh, it, it's force major is not an air cover for me to run away from my contractual obligations i will still have to pay for services that have been rendered in actuality so if somebody was um, you know rendering that service till up till 4 days ago and no they no longer can't because they are unable to travel uh, from broadbindi to islamabad because the you know um, at the entry point they're stopped so it doesn't mean that i don't have to pay i will have to pay till the last day that the service was actually rendered to me so it's very important to keep that in mind force majeure is not an escape boat or a door for you to run away from your contractual obligations um you know um it does again there are a lot of contracts people don't or, or smaller businesses don't read them but you know you uh, companies are asked for a performance guarantee for example um so now that performance guarantee um is handed over you know maybe worth 2 million 3 million and this is the, exactly the kind of times when those performance guarantees come into play uh, if not fully but partially so um again it's important that uh, you know um force majeure is there and all but a force majeure notice will is not always a positive sometimes it can actually be a negative so perhaps it's better for the parties to not invoke force majeure and uh, you know work out an arrangement where we say all right you know um, let's uh, ex- stretch the deliverables let's uh, you know uh, extend the milestone dates that we had to complete so and so and so activity and you know move a uh, business as usual because again it's a it's it's not a winning situation for anyone it is a ultimate end frustration where you know you are no longer able to finish the contract fully or partially and then if you know this starts going around generally business is going to go down in the in in the whole country right right okay so okay so um, before i i move to the delay part of the contract let's let's just let's just you know since since you've already mentioned that how important it is it is for the, even the small businesses to you know take the legal counsel professional legal counsel before entering into into absolutely crucial for anybody um, uh, who decides to enter into any sort of a business to have a legal counsel on board whether that's a cousin or a relative <laughs> you know please uh, all never deal with the you know a lawyer on your own always make sure you have a counsel representing you because it's very important even if you're a small business if you're a sole uh, you know entrepreneur a single person uh, you know working uh, uh, providing a service or what not please always ensure that you have a contract where you are also covered where you're covered legally there's no loopholes and there's always uh, you know room for because because as a as a lawyer and um, after a 15 year career this is something that i've learned from this situation is that clauses that i used to consider as boilerplate are now actually you know for the first time i'm seeing them come into play i never paid attention to force major clauses i thought yeah they're this just there you know so god forbid there's a terrorism act uh, so something is delayed so okay it's delayed for 20 30 days and you know that's fine but this is an ongoing pandemic that is not ending right so um so yes it's absolutely necessary to have things uh, evaluated from a legal point of view right okay so let's 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 go uh, right let's come back to the delay part so you know most of the supply chain is disrupted because let's say uh, that that uh, things that need to be shipped you know there are ships stranded at the sea right now ports are not allowing the ent- uh, entry to the ships or you mm-hmm. know the or there are like there are like different checks that any equipment or anything uh that's being imported has to go through right or you know it's be it a sea port or be it uh, a dry port 
So, so this means that there are delays in delivery or there are no deliveries at all, right? So how does FM apply in, in, in this situation? I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, now there's one question where you're asking that where there's border controls and, you know, things are not being let into uh, one country. So one way, uh, the other day I was discussing this with somebody, actually a very important part of uh, this COVID uh, situation is uh, for companies and organizations to and countries to be very, very careful not to become racist, you know, to basically start discriminating against certain, um, uh, you know, certain equipment that comes from a certain country or certain region as, you know, being Corona uh, prone. So it, it, that's, it, we, we have to make sure that we don't discriminate against any particular, uh, you know, origin of the doc, of, 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 of anything. You know, we, we can't just stop, start like saying, oh, this certain shipment is coming from China, we will not let them come, you know. So that, that's a very important part of uh, uh, the whole COVID uh, scenario. Secondly, initially when, um, you know, um, there are certain goods that can only be uh, sent across through sea, they cannot be air carried. Um, in that situation, a lot of equipment that um, was coming was facing delays because it was coming to the ports and it was getting fumigated and then it was coming forward um, and, you know, entering the market at a delayed rate. Eventually, uh, when, you know, borders started getting sealed, um, uh, I'm not exactly aware of what the situation is uh, globally, but in Pakistan, uh, at this point in time, because our main ports being in the Sindh uh, and Balochistan uh, provinces, the other port is not fully functional as yet for uh, certain uh, high duty equipment. Uh, you know, they are, um, uh, but not for like uh, certain uh, um, high priced equipment because of the safety in traveling and moving the equipment from the port to the mainland. Uh, but uh, as far as Karachi is concerned, because of the lockdown situation in Sindh, right now, Sindh, there is, from Sindh port, there is no movement of goods because nothing can really get out of Sindh at this point in time. So, yes, uh, now. Again, the supply chain um, getting affected in the start of the crisis um, in the first two months was different. In the next three or four months, we are now going to be dealing with a graver situation where certain re um, relaxations will have to be made for uh, equipment uh, um, to, you know, be able to move out of Sindh itself. So countries are generally, you know, medical equipment is going um, through air carriage. So whatever can go through air carriage is still being managed. But things that um, um, hazardous equipment, which cannot be air carried and, you know, which or which is very heavy, has to travel by sea. So, you know, yes, proper mechanisms have to be now put in place and focus there so that the supply chain does not get disrupted like this. Right. Okay. So... So what are the what are the workforce obligation like what are the obligations from employers toward the workforce or how can can uh, can employers use this fm clause uh, to reduce this cost by uh, cutting labor because we're we're all you know you know most of the business are businesses are in, are in this crisis right so how does how does that work for employers in terms of workforce See, this is a, uh, to be honest, nightmare situation for employers uh, everywhere. I think globally, it's uh, um, no, none, no employer, no entity is now looking to cancel it, its contracts because obviously a lot of business planning goes, um, you know, when, when you engage uh, certain vendors to provide certain services, a lot of business planning and a lot of, uh, you know, hard work and a lot of uh, uh, revenue estimation goes behind all of that. Um, at this point in time, I don't think any, um, you know, people, uh, yeah, there's a lot of pressure from, in, the, in Pakistan, there's a lot of pressure from the industry, you know, towards, you know, going towards a sort of a relaxed lockdown or, or you know, sort of a, you know, a business friendly lockdown and all that. So, yes, the, the industry generally, um, you know, in Pakistan, um, whether, you know, that's the agriculture industry, whether that's the telecom industry, whether that's any other industry is now working hand in hand with the government to provide, uh, you know, ease of business. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, going in a systematic manner, employers right now, they just want to get back to work and they want to get back to business as usual. You know, um, we've tried and tested this in the past two months it's been what two months since the lockdown at least we've tried and tested that okay a lot of work can actually take place remotely you know so perhaps you know we would not need those huge offices and those you know car fleets anymore but then again um, what we would invest on is you know uh, and we uh, you know perhaps 
saving that cost and putting that elsewhere. So right now um, is a situation where everybody just kind of wants a systematic manner in which they can continue to run their businesses. Right. So, so this is going to be my, last, uh, be my last question, and then I'm going to take some uh, throw some questions from the audience your way. Uh, a few questions. So, so what steps that you know that government has taken to bring clarity on this matter and you know help businesses mitigate this risk? And what more do you think needs to be done at this point? Um, so I can I can only answer your questions from uh, my limited uh, uh, you know legal knowledge. So I don't know about how uh, you know this this works commercially, but uh, we've all seen that the federal government has announced a stimulus package of about 1.2 trillion rupees. Uh, you know we have uh, major stakeholders in, in in the business sector who are contributing massively towards uh, this uh, you know relief fund for covid um, you know we have countries that are sending medical equipment they're sending doctors you know we have people personally contributing towards rations and you know um, uh, 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 they're volunteering to you know distribute rations and stuff like that um, after the national action plan was implemented on the 7th of march 2020 uh, we have started seeing that uh, you know banks have started functioning um, uh, they, they've not, never actually shut down they're functioning on roster basis you know they're uh, working alternate uh, uh, days roster basis beyond restricted times as well government has gone um, you know they're taking few steps uh, positive steps in promoting cashless banking i myself have uh, two bank accounts and uh, one bank account I was not using online, uh, uh, you know, uh, banking because it was just a salary account of some other one. And I got a message that, you know, they made my online uh, transaction free, uh, you know, and they just activated it. I I'd never <laughs> verified it or anything. So, you know, they're, they're uh, doing all they can. Of course, uh, there has been uh, the SECP, for example, has relaxed its timelines because April, March is the time for uh, AGMs and uh, submissions for a lot of countries, uh, companies, uh, private and uh, public. So SECP is also relaxed its timelines. FBR is also, um, you know, um, assisted in the sense that, you know, they've given a bit of a relaxation in tax um, uh, deadlines to when uh, you know those were to be submitted so there's there's uh, there's been uh, the you know srs program from the government where they've said that you know they'll uh, on biometric verification obviously you know which is very good thing so lesser chances it will be misused um, that you know certain funds um, or uh, a stipend amount will be uh, dispersed to those uh, those in need so the government is i uh, doing perhaps you know perhaps they can do much better but then it's 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 a it's a national effort that has to be made so you know um, rather than uh, focusing on you know um, or, or, or I, I, you know, we've all looked at it. No matter what the government does, I mean, let's look at the footage that we look at of all these markets and bazaars and 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 Mondays. People are like piled up and they as if nothing is happening. So while the government is facilitating um, businesses and you know um, those for those who can use um, the, this ease and 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 uh, create a business model using all of this, a new business model, they will benefit. But those who will not um, and just kind of expect things to come and, and, and you know, line themselves up, you know, then, then that, that's, that's trouble. So every entity, whether big or small, every business, whether a small startup or a settled business has to be a socially responsible citizen at this point. And, uh, you know, um, cooperate with the government, cooperate with one another, cooperate with your vendors, you know, companies, again, um, there are examples of big companies who are very mindful of, you know, not firing people or their support staff or, you know, uh, not paying their vendors or not paying their employees. They're doing all they can, um, you know, to be supportive. But then again, it doesn't mean that a medium sized business is going to fire a half its workforce and then expect the government to come in with a bailout program. Again, we cannot compare ourselves to a developed country. We are a developing country. So we have constraints. We don't have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, backup stored up in, in, in our reserves. We are already uh, a, a country that has a lot to struggle with. Right, but can or shouldn't the, shouldn't the government come up with, you know, maybe some sort of temporary ordinance, like there's a debate going around uh, school fees, right? Because uh, the Sindh government has come up with something about that. So can the government come up with something about 
rents in this situation, loans. Is this is there any example globally of this? Is it is it is it something that government can do? Um, see again, uh, th that's another debate. It's going to completely go off course. But uh, expecting the government to walk in with a magic wand is is uh, you know uh, a bit far fetched for us at this point. Um, if school fees, uh, you know, schools have been asked to reduce their fee by twenty percent. Uh, you know, there's a stay order that now they've taken in, instead. So, you know, of course, they've got their own, um, you know, expense centers and they have their own reasons. I, I, I don't uh, necessarily agree with this mindset that, you know, oh, there's a big greedy person sitting behind all these private schools, you know, taking up all that money. Of course, you know, every business and every uh, um, industry and every sector has its constraints and the educational sector has its constraints as well. So, you know, um, talking about, uh, 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 you know, the, the, these kind of panels make it perhaps it's a good idea for you to have somebody from the private uh, education sector come and, you know, answer your questions in, in one of your future panels. Right. All right. So I think I'm going to take a few questions uh, from the people who are listening. So I have it here. The first question is from Raza is, is issuing a FM notice have pros and cons. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if FM notice is issued against a project which is almost 90% complete, then there's a probability that the customer may reject the order invoking FM notice from their contract. What mm -hmm. should be done in that scenario? I mean, this is very, very specific question, but you know, you can maybe answer it generally. Right. Yes. So, the, um, so um, again, uh, looking at the text of uh, the force majeure clause, even if somebody has uh, given you a notice of force majeure clause immediately as soon as the pandemic started, uh, but then again, this this uh, requirement that the payment should be made for the services actually rendered, you know. So if you've done ninety percent of the work, and uh, it does not mean that somebody can illegally, you know. Uh, serve a notice to you and even if they do serve a force majeure notice to you you have every um, right in the world to send a respond a, a response and and uh, you know rebut this and say that you know with, with proper evidencing you know this this and this and this so you don't have to necessarily accept that force majeure notice right uh, all right so so do you think that um, uh, Businesses can work out a formula with uh, employees to deal best with the situation instead of instead of uh, uh, what do you call it terminating employment. They can come up with a reduced salary formula for for a. No, for, of... I, force majeure. I don't. In in my opinion, I don't think force majeure would apply to um, employ employment as such, uh, because employ for private employees, the contracts are uh, you know contract between the employer and the employee, and that has has you know other ways of terminating people than to be honest invoking a force majeure clause. So which can be because of internal policy, um, and definitely it should not be something that should be used to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, lay off a, a chunk of the workforce, and uh, um, it can absolutely be challenged in courts. You know, there's labor co labor courts that are there. Uh, you know, um, so force majeure is not something that I, 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 in my opinion, I don't think any employer would use it as a basis of, uh, you know, um, curtailing uh, their workforce or, or, or you know, making cutbacks. So I, I don't think it can be invoked in the employment uh, sector. Right. And okay, so the next question is. So next question is about the loans, about the business loans. So does how does FM impact the business loans? Uh, you know, the loans that have been taken by SMEs, and there are some you know yes. installments and right. So, so basically, creditor loans again. Uh, uh, State Bank uh, has been very uh, helpful in terms of uh, how how they're dealing with the entire creditor situation because obviously the banks and uh, uh, the rupee suddenly you know went into negative and dollar went all the way up and now the rupees started to slowly climb back up. Um, as we can see, um, force majeure clauses again are definitely present there in uh, you know uh, 
creditor agreements they're there and uh, of course uh, you know reach out to your uh, bank and uh, you know under the notices clause general notices clause you know write a letter to them uh, explain your situation to them and work out a new installment plan in terms of uh, you know how how you're going to be able to re uh, return uh, your installments because definitely that's a situation where you know your business is not earning or it's shut down you know how you're going to pay back uh, any installment that comes due and uh, in my opinion uh, the banks would not be unreasonable because this is again a situation that does not affect a region or a country it's affecting the entire you know world at this point so 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 it should be uh, it, it's a reasonable uh, uh, requirement or reasonable expectation from somebody to expect a sort of a change in their installment uh, plan at this point okay and okay another very specific question so if a business is not impacted by lockdown at all despite whatever is going on around uh, and whatever is going on at the macro level let's say if the business is not directly in, in, uh, impacted by the lockdown so can that business use this clause at this no definitely um, you uh, see i can't tell my landlord i'm not going to pay you rent because uh, you know corona virus is going on right <laughs> because while it's going on and there's a pandemic but it's a contract that i have which has nothing to do like there is no impact that the covid whether i have a job or not you know indirectly whether i can pay the rent or not indirectly because i am unemployed or what not doesn't matter i have a contract which is unimpacted by this so that no it's a clear cut no if your business or your transactions nature is not such that is impacted by this pandemic then you cannot just uh, find like a, an escape door to you know run out of so no it's not unfortunately that is not the case yeah but let's just take a clear case of uh, something which has a base cost i mean every business has renting rent as a base cost right but some businesses actually or are, are in the business of renting right let's say a warehouse you know i mean if if, if you're a cold storage or a warehouse right and suddenly due to the due to the situation uh, the products are not coming in into into that into that way as you you know and your business is that means your revenue is impacted and i mean you cannot i mean you you cannot you use the revenue to pay the rent for that facility for that space even in that case the the the, the tenant cannot uh, invoke the fm clause no because ishan again it's the same example i gave you that uh, i'm a person who has a job and because of corona i lose my job but i live in a house and my landlord asks me for rent i can't say because i'm no longer earning when there's a force majeure situation i can't pay you rent right similarly in this situation where there's a warehouse which i can see um, you know in 6 months i'm not utilizing it there's nothing it's an extra space that's going on what i can do or i should do as as a sensible lawyer is give a termination notice of 30 days that okay i intend to vacate these premises um, as per the notice period in the contract and vacate the premises and terminate the contract and you know get back uh, part of my security amount uh, which i am able to get back rather than raise force majeure because it's it, it's just it, it's not correct it doesn't make sense it's a, it's a loss for me actually you know it's a loss for everybody but uh, most definitely for for me who's already suffering from the business right uh okay i think uh, there's some other questions you know they uh, probably we we already answered them during our discussion right is is moing is there anything else that you you think we haven't discussed and you probably want to add in in this in the session no no i i i'm glad that you know we got very uh, uh, clear and uh, and very very uh, sort of uh, focused questions i'm thankful for you have to having provided me the opportunity and uh, i think uh, we need panels like these to keep everybody engaged and up to date in 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 such uh, times of crisis definitely and and thank you so much for being here with us today taking time out from your busy schedules i i understand that pleasure. this this pandemic situation this work from home situation has actually uh, been very tough for everyone uh, probably the work has actually doubled up for many uh, uh, so it's 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 so it's it's, uh, it's it's not very ideal situation for everyone but i think what we can conclude from the discussion today is you know which is which was very helpful your insight your your knowledge was very helpful i'm sure for the business startups who who listening so what we can conclude is that force majeure is there it can be applied on the uh, 
uh, on this COVID-19 situation. But every situation uh, under this COVID-19 situation is not where you can involve yes this. it's a subjective it's a subjective application and you have to really analyze the circumstances and the set of situations and whether it will actually be advantageous or a bigger disadvantage to to do that or perhaps you know it makes more sense to relax your timelines and you know relax your deliverables or you know um, uh, or perhaps even terminate an arrangement then uh, constantly keep invoking force majeure like that because um, Number one, it doesn't constantly apply. Um, and number two, uh, you know, it has, it, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's an absolute uh, last minute, uh, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's the end. You will actually take this as the last, last resort. Right, right. So thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, thank you so much to the uh, audience, to people who've, who've taken time out to listen to it. I, I hope it was very, uh, uh, it was helpful for all of you and we'll be, we'll be sending across a feedback form as well uh, to learn about the session from you and how we can improve it and what topics we can add and this, we just displayed our, our uh, Facebook pages uh, on the screen so for you to stay tuned for the uh, for this session we'll be, we'll be having a weekly session under a banner of Thai or uh, we create. Uh, thank you to the Thai team who, who, who worked behind the, uh, behind the screen to organize this uh, virtual show today. So I think that's that. So we, we will conclude now. Uh, so have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Khudafiz. Khudafiz.